Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kishore Mabubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this book launch uh, by Sir Michael uh, Barber. Uh, I know you came to listen to him, so I'll do my usual thing and make three points uh, to all of you. Uh, the first point I'm going to make is that uh, uh, government is back. You know, there was a time when the world was infatuated uh, with markets, and this is just, you know, the result of the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, when I think uh, Ronald Reagan said very famously, you know, when somebody asked him about the role of the government, he said, government is not the solution. Government is the problem. <laughs> and as you know, that led to a very fashionable anti-government, minimal government uh, campaigns and the world has probably seen as a result of the financial crisis that now perhaps you do need to you do you do need to have strong governments after all in the world. Uh, but my second point is that while we all agree that yes we do need strong governments, we are not quite sure where to go in the world to look for good models of governance. In the past, and I can say this as living in Singapore, if you asked me the question 30 to 40 years ago, in Singapore, you'd have said, oh, of course, you want to learn about government, you go to Europe. Europe's got the best governments in the world, and whatever Europe, Europe does, it'll do very well, and Europe will never have a major financial crisis, we'll never have to worry about a currency holding together, and guess what? We have problems happening down there too. So clearly now, if you're looking for models of what good governance is. You can't, you can't look for any one place. You have to go around the world uh, to do so and study best practices uh, around the world. Which is why, this is my third point, we are very blessed that we have Sir Michael Barber here with us. If there's one man in this world who has spent a large part of his life studying and understanding governments, it is uh, Sir Michael uh, Barber. Uh, he started what he told me as a school teacher but he has come a long way. He will work for uh, the government of Tony Blair in something called the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit, PMDU. He then went on to work for McKinsey, and now he's uh, working for Pearson uh, on advising them uh, on education. But over the years, he has written, uh, published uh, on all aspects of government, and he's become very famous for creating a word that is now unpronounceable. Uh, it's about how you deliver good governance. It is called, and I can't pronounce it, I'll try, it's pronounced deliverology. <laughs> it's difficult, but it, it describes uh, what Sir, Sir Michael has tried to do. And of course, he's here, as you know, to launch his new book, How to Run the Government so that citizens benefit and taxpayers don't go crazy. And I would strongly encourage you uh, to get a copy outside uh, uh, before you leave. And of course, and I have no doubt that by the time uh, Michael finishes speaking, you'll be even more enthusiastic uh, to buy a copy of the book. So, Michael, with that, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, well, look, thank you, Kishore, and thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to be here. I, I, I come to Singapore. It always feels fleeting when I visit because um, my visits have always been brief, two, three days, and today's only uh, one day, but it's always a real pleasure to come here. It's a place of ideas and uh, interest and, uh, and indeed uh, very, very uh, good government. Uh, so uh, very inspiring. And as, as a person who's also worked on education extensively, Singapore is a place uh, we, uh, we who are interested in global education systems look to for inspiration and ideas. So fantastic to be here and particularly fantastic to be in the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, uh, which is now... Um, firmly establishes one of the leading centers of thinking about public policy, not just in this region, but uh, generally around the, the globe. Um, and so I'm very, very glad to be here and on honored to, um, to talk to you about my, my new book. Um, so thank you, Kishore, for the opportunity and, and thanks to all of you. Um, deliverology was actually originally a term of abuse. Many of the uh, epithets in politics are started as terms of abuse like Tory, uh, Whig, etc., uh, etc. Et um, and um, and uh, deliverology was what the Treasury officials used to describe what we, the uh, Prime Minister's delivery unit, did. But if you think about it, there is a kind of serious point, which is if you put ol ology on the end of something, it means you're trying to move towards a science, biology, physiology, whatever. 
And what they were saying is, in PMDU, they're sort of working their way to a, a theory, we're in a, we're in a school of uh, public policy here, an, an approach uh, that is, has a, some kind of scientific basis. Now, public policy will never be pure science. It's social science, it's individuals, it's biography, it's competing ambitions, it's conflict, all of those things. That's what government will always be like around the world. Uh, and that's how we'd like it to be. But the ology bit of this is that there are a number of things that you can do to make it more likely that a government will achieve the results that it sets. And my book uh, is an attempt to summarize that knowledge in a way that I hope is engaging for a general reader, not just for government officials or um, political scientists or ministers, but for people who read a great newspaper and are interested in policy or politics or government. And I've tried to write it in, in an engaging way. And what I found was that right around the world, developing world and the developed world, every continent, with the possible exception of Antarctica, you could find examples of really good government. Um, and when you looked at them, you found, found again and again the same kinds of uh, elements in the way the policy was implemented that worked. Um, I then, um, to try to make it more engaging, but also because I originally studied history, um, found that you could look back through history, and of course nobody in history used the word deliverology, but they did sometimes think like a deliverologist. Um, and I found examples from medieval European history uh, and modern American history, two areas that I've uh, studied extensively in my youth and still read about, uh, and so on, and tried to take examples to show that these are enduring uh, themes in good government. So that's what the book's about, and I hope people, if you read it, you'll find it engaging and interesting uh, and fun as well as informative. Um, there was a mayor of New York in the early 80s called Ed Koch, I don't know if any of you remember him, but on his campaign uh, speech, he would set out his 10 policies and then he'd say, if you agree with me on eight of them, vote for me. If you agree on all 10, see a psychiatrist. Um, and I feel a bit the same. If you read my book and agree on all of it, uh, you probably uh, need to see a psychiatrist. But lots of it I think you'll find, I hope you'll find interesting, informative uh, and useful. I want to uh, just comment on uh, what Kishore said about government being back. I do think that's true. Government has, have taken, has taken a battering through the a global financial crisis. Sometimes it's taken the blame for a crisis, often not of its own making. Sometimes it was a contributor, depending on where you are in the world. But either way, what we learned through the financial crisis is that no market works without government. So even if you favour minimal government, Somebody's got to regulate the market. Somebody's got to break up monopolies. Uh, somebody's got to enforce property rights. Somebody's got to enforce uh, individual rights. Somebody's got to enforce, even in medieval Europe, people were enforcing weights and measures because otherwise people were being deceived when they're exchanging corn or, or, or whatever it might be. Somebody's got to regulate. A market is a human construct and it requires government uh, to make it work. That's one way in which government is important. Government is also important for guaranteeing human individual rights and liberties. Um, there's a tendency in the debate to be critical of government and see human rights as something that are a defence against government, and sometimes, of course, they are. But actually, you only get human rights if government enforces them. So again, government is important even if you want it at that minimal level. And then, of course, there are services, infrastructure will be one, uh, education will be another, where pretty much everybody around the world thinks those are things that government should be the leading provider of, uh, if not the sole provider. You put all that together, and even that, which is the kind of minimal government job, um, uh, 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 and if you add in security, that's a pretty substantial task. And if you get that right, it makes an enormous difference to people's lives. If you get it wrong, it makes an enormous difference the other way. And then there are countries that want a bigger government, and there are politicians that advocate that, and that's a perfectly legitimate political choice too. You see it working well in Scandinavia and Canada, parts of Australia and so on. So whether you want big government or small government, which is um, you want effective, accountable government. And I think that one of the big moral issues of our time over the next 10 to 15 years will be how to achieve effective, accountable government. Because there's a risk facing all of us, which is a growing cynicism about government, not just about particular governments, but about government in general. That is potentially corrosive, potentially dangerous. Uh, because, as I've just been arguing, without government, uh, uh, 
human life, as Thomas Hobbes said all those years ago, is nasty, brutish, and short. And if you uh, don't want to believe Hobbes, have a look at Libya, Syria, uh, or Somalia over the last few years. I'm arguing that government being effective is something we should all be interested in, which leads to this. Too many political leaders, here's one of them, Viktor Chernomyr, in Prime Minister of Russia in the uh, 1990s, one of the very few funny Russian politicians uh, who said after two years in office when he resigned, we tried to do better but everything turned out as usual. It's a very Russian view of the world. He also said, by the way, we keep inventing new institutions and they all turn out to be the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Um, that was before Putin was even on the agenda. So. Uh, Many, many politicians around the world feel like that when they leave office. Uh, and my book is written for politicians who don't want to feel like that when they leave office. We want them to feel as though they achieved something, achieved something of real value to the citizens uh, uh, who they've been elected or chosen to govern. So, the book has eight chapters and then a conclusion, introduction and a conclusion and eight chapters. The first one is called Priorities. Um, it's a kind of... One of, the, one of the reviews, actually, um, in Britain, in Prospect magazine, um, which was broadly positive, had this sentence, which I think was meant as a compliment, but you can see it's slightly ambiguous. It said, Michael, Michael has no um, difficulty in stating the obvious. <laughs> uh, so one of the obvious things is a government needs priorities. You need priorities. Um, you can't do everything. Governments have to do a lot of stuff that aren't priorities. That's true. But if you're going to change something, be clear about what they are. What are the things that over a term of office you want to make different about your country? And describe them to people. Say how the country will be different as a result of your efforts. Um, you don't have to call that different thing a target, although we did in the Blair administration. But you do need to be clear what you're trying to achieve and explain to people and then be able to check during your term of office where you're making progress. So priorities are important. We had a debate about this in the Blair cabinet in 2002, and this is the um, chart I used to help uh, describe the prioritization process. Um, one, one debate that rages in many governments is about how bold to be, how radical to be. Generally, certainly in the Blair administration, the politicians wanted to be bold and the civil servants wanted to be a bit more cautious. So Blair would say, let's be bold. Maybe his health minister would say, let's be bold, and the civil servants would say, maybe we should do a pilot study. <laughs> or could we do some more research first? Or back then you could say, why don't we try it out in Scotland first? <laughs> All these things are getting harder. Uh, so we have this debate up and down the vertical axis. Um, and neither of those is actually very good. You don't want controversy without impact, but equally you don't want the status quo in most places. You want to change things. And so you have to think about how well you do things. And you can have a cautious goal, a not very ambitious incremental goal, and do it well, and you'll get some improved outcomes. You'll earn some political credit. You'll be able to make some progress. People will say, oh, they know what they're doing. And then you can do transformation. And when I talk about delivery, I'm talking about that stuff. And any, any given government at any given time should have some things that it's trying to transform and some things where it's trying to get improved outcomes. And you can use this map to take a government's portfolio of activity and see where you think they are. And then you can decide how you can move them from the green side of the chart to the blue side of the chart. So prioritization is lesson number one. Lots, there's lots more in the book. I'm just taking you through some highlights. The second thing is organize to deliver. Um, it's kind of obvious. You've got some priorities. Now organize your government to get it done. How do you do that? Um, and there's lots to, lots to do, think about through how the civil service is reformed and what institutions you want. But a lot of it is about having um, a degree of focus. Um, the problem is that for many politicians, particularly if they're newly elected, in their heads, they've got this idea that you get the policy right, uh, maybe you pass a law and then the implementation will take care of itself and after an unspecified time the results will emerge. But the truth is for most big things it takes, the implementation is actually more difficult than deciding the policy. So if we look at the Obama administration which has got many achievements but also has had some challenges, 
in the first few months it passed uh, what became known as Obamacare. Big health reform, something that for generations um, had, America had failed to do, so a big achievement. And then it kind of goes off the radar, and then the next time it comes on the radar, it's because of the failure of a website. That is a delivery failure, that's an implementation failure. Uh, and it was an avoidable implementation failure. Now they put, got it back on track to their credit, they kind of rescued things, but they lost a lot of political capital, they lost a lot of progress, that was an avoidable error. And that's because the skills that get you elected aren't the same skills that run a country. They're very, very different skill sets and the kind of people that are good at running a country aren't the kind of people necessarily that are good at running elections. So that's how not to think about implementation. This is how we thought about in Blair's second term when he learnt the lessons uh, about not doing it this way. Uh, we had a delivery unit. You don't have to have a delivery unit, but having a, part, a focused part of the bureaucracy that is checking implementation on priorities is actually quite helpful. We had data analysts, number crunchers, bean counters. We loved our bean counters. We had a team working on each of the four priority areas. Uh, we had myself and a, a small support team. So you've got five teams, um, somewhere between 35 and 40 people focused 24 hours a day on delivering the Prime Minister's agenda. Not what should the policy be, that's already decided. Is it being implemented by the relevant department? If it's not being implemented, what are we going to do about it? So organising to deliver is the second uh, theme of the book. The third theme is about strategy, uh, thinking about how to, uh, over a period of time, to uh, make the change that you want. And I'm not going to spend long on this because this is the longest chapter in the book. It's actually um, uh, I think quite um, important uh, and I'm going to skim over it but you can come back to me on it. Um, one of the things about government is that communication of how you're going about doing things easily gets lost. The people certainly get confused. Often even the ministers don't really know what the strategy is, never mind the officials, the workforce and the use of the service. Um, and it turns out that Admiral Nelson, the great British Admiral who um, uh, fought the French during the Napoleonic Wars was an innovator in this respect. And the reason he won a series of great naval battles against the Napoleonic uh, Navy was that he cracked communication. He cracked empowerment of a team. So whereas uh, traditionally what um, admirals did in those days was run a set of flags up a flagpole uh, with different instructions and the captains of the ships knew the codes and they could read from the flagship the message from the Admiral. Um, good in theory, but actually in a, a battle, sprawling battle where you're uh, at close quarters with an enemy ship and there's um, smoke from the cannons everywhere, it's often quite hard to read the Admiral's ship, which may be quite a long way, maybe on fire, you don't know. It's quite difficult. So what Nelson did in the run-up to a battle was invite the captains to have lunch or dinner with him on the flagship. And you usually knew ships move slowly in those days. You know a battle's coming in the next couple of weeks. He went through the strategy with each of them individually, with all of them collectively. And then he said to them, so that's my battle plan, and we've shaped it, and you've been involved, and uh, we've got a really good battle plan, and you've helped me refine it. That's the battle plan. I'll put the flags up the mast. But if you can't read the mast, don't worry. Just attack the nearest French ship. Get in, and, get in amongst them. Don't wait for instructions. Just get on with it that his actual phrase was, get in amongst them. And so the British, cap the, the British captains knew what to do when communication broke down, but the French captains didn't know what to do. They were waiting for the signs on the flagpole. Um, and so what I've tried to do in the strategy chapter is set out ways of thinking about reforming things. And if you're reforming a service, there are basically, and these are described in the book, five ways of reforming them from uh, trusting the professionals through to privatising it. I don't recommend any one of them for any particular circumstance. I go through the evidence on them. They're different opportunities, different ways of thinking about it. If you've got a really inefficient energy sector, privatisation may well be the answer, but you have to do it well. If you've got a really inefficient education sector, privatisation is unlikely to be the answer, but choice and competition or hierarchy and targets might be. And then down the bottom, there's three things that government has to do, whichever of the approaches, and those three things to taken together are stewardship. Getting, making sure the system is, you leave it in better uh, circumstances than you found it. 
and I'm not going to go through all of them now. Uh, but Singapore is actually good at some of this, uh, very good at it. The strategy part, the thinking ahead, anticipating how the world might change, uh, Singapore is seen as a model around the world, and there are many other areas where I could uh, mention Singapore as an example of doing these things well. Uh, which leads to planning. I use the word planning as opposed to plans because I was very influenced by Dwight D. Eisenhower who planned D-Day in 1944 uh, and then became president. He said this, in preparing for battle I've always found that plans are useless but the planning is indispensable. The written plan never turns out to work but the planning that you've done makes all the difference. Um, here are some examples. You've got to have a delivery chain. So whatever you're, you've got to plan a delivery chain. What is the way that the minister or the prime minister influences the front line? Here's the delivery chain of the national literacy strategy in England. One person at the sponsor, uh, 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 answerable for minister, that was me. A director of, the, director of the national literacy strategy, 15 regional directors and so on, and then 3.5 million children uh, soaking it all up at the far end of the delivery chain. If you haven't got a delivery chain that's clear, you're very unlikely to deliver. They're often more complicated than this. I just give it as an example, but you need to draw the delivery chain. Then there's trajectories. How will the data, you've set some goal for the future. You know where the data is now. How will it change over time? In Whitehall, I don't know how it is in Singapore, but if you ask somebody for a trajectory, they go rushing back to the department. They get out their most sophisticated analytical equipment, which is called a ruler, and they draw a line uh, that is a straight line, but the real world doesn't move in straight lines, it moves in curved lines and sometimes seasonal lines. Once you've got the trajectory right, then you can track progress against it. If you do literacy, it's like this. You focus on it, it gets better and then it gets harder because you've got to change the way teachers teach. If you do infrastructure, it's more likely to be like this. You've got to invest and then it'll get better after you've done the investment. I should say in the delivery unit, we were very suspicious of this kind of trajectory because normally what would, it would be flat for about three years and then it would go up and you knew that the civil servant was thinking that in three years I'll be in another job so I'll do the flat bit and leave the, the steep curve to somebody else but sometimes they really are like that um, and once you've got that this is Punjab right now I work with the Chief Minister of Punjab I've been going uh, 44 times over the last six years here are the 36 districts of Punjab this is whether they are on or off trajectory on facilities, having running water, electricity, boundary walls, toilets for the girls and boys. And you can see how tracking progress against trajectory enables you to target your intervention to the districts where there's a problem. And you can ignore the rest. You don't need blanket regulation, you just need targeted interventions. Um, and then there's routines. Um, government is full of crises, events, things going wrong, problems, difficulties, challenges, media stories, ministers in scandals, etc., etc. That's the nature of government. If you just deal with those, you end up feeling like Victor Chernomirin. But if you build some routines that check progress on the priorities, you can make an enormous difference. Um, we had two routines for Blair. One was stock take meetings, reviewing progress with the relevant minister every two months. So the Minister of Health will see Blair six times in a year. He can prepare for that meeting. He can say to his officials, I'd really like this problem solved before I go and see the Prime Minister. So he's got a deadline all the time. The routine makes all the difference to progress. The other one was, um, so Coolidge, not one of the most famous American presidents, he wanted, the one thing he wanted to do in the world was cut the budget. And every Friday, he had budget cutting meetings. Even after he was no longer, uh, the, the election of November 1928 had happened, he was still president through into 1929. Even after that election, he kept doing the budget cutting meetings on a Friday. If you were a civil servant under Coolidge, you got given a pencil that long. And if you wanted to get a new pencil, you had to take a stub back less than half an inch long and they would give you a new one. Without the stub, none, nothing. I keep telling the British civil servants who faced cuts recently, they've seen nothing yet. Um, serious about his priorities. Um, this is an extract from a monthly note to Churchill. Monthly notes are a good routine. You just update the Prime Minister regularly on his priorities. In MI5 in 1943, they were worried that Churchill wasn't paying them enough attention. People in Singapore uh, know only too well that Churchill had a lot of direct distractions in 1943 uh, from MI5. 
uh, not least uh, what was happening in this very uh, country. But they decided, as we decided in the delivering it, that they'd write him a monthly note on his priorities. And uh, you can see this is an extract from it. Uh, it's in the history of MI5. Um, they then said, well, if we're going to write him a monthly note, we'd better make sure it's well written. And they got their best writer to write it. Uh, he was a guy called Anthony Blunt, who those of you with a long memory will remember was a Soviet spy. So the irony is that from 1943 to 1945, MI5 wrote a monthly note to the Prime Minister, written by Anthony Blunt and cleared with Stalin's agents before it went to the Prime Minister. Um, that first monthly note, Churchill wrote at the bottom, deeply interesting. I wrote monthly notes for four years to Tony Blair. He never wrote deeply interesting on anything I ever sent him. Uh, but routines are really important. And then problem solving. Um, I love this quote from the great American historian. No experience of the failure of his policy could shake his belief in its essential excellence. Commenting on Philip II, the King of Spain in the second half of the 16th century, who, among other things, sent an armada to invade England, uh, which, which came to grief. Um, too often, problem solving is like this. Things get worse and you keep going. The Americans in Vietnam, things get worse, you keep sending more troops. Things get worse, you keep sending more troops. Uh, she wrote about that as well. So this is the mindset to avoid, because you don't problem solving, you convince yourself that what you're doing is working even when it's uh, failing all around you. What you do do is decide how big a problem it is. Is it a really big problem, see along the bottom, with a, an unclear solution? You've, that is a crisis. Unclear solution, big problem, that is a crisis. Uh, and then there's different levels, and you can approach them. I describe this in the book, different ways of thinking about crisis or, or problem solving at different levels. And there's lots of techniques you can use. The main message is, if you've got a problem, do something about it. Don't be like Philip II, which leads to this point. When I used to go to Russia a lot, um, uh, which hasn't been recently, but, but 10 years or more ago, I tried to learn a bit of Russian, but I wasn't very good. And they said, don't worry, Michael, there's only two phrases you need to learn in Russian. One is Ktovinovat, which is who's to blame. And the second is Stodeliat, which is what should we do? Um, and in government, when there's a problem, the first question that normally gets asked is Ktovinovat, who's to blame? And if you ask that question first, it's very hard to solve the problem because everybody is minding their back or knifing somebody else. And so nobody's going to tell you the truth. You have to reverse the questions and do, what should we do? How should we solve the problem? Do that first. And if there's still blame to allocate, deal with that later. If you put the blame question first, and the media will always put the blame question first, you'll never get the problem solved. Um, and then there's making the policy irreversible. One way of establishing a, le a legacy is uh, this Mexican saying, um, you define yourself by your predecessor and your successor and you say my predecessor was a uh, an idiot and my successor is a traitor um, that's one way of getting a legacy uh, not terribly satisfying likely to breed cynicism uh, if quite funny Julia Frank was actually a fantastic minister of health in Mexico and here the thing to think about is embedding your policy in wider circles so you, you you're part of the guiding coalition at the center can you get the system leaders the unit leaders, let's say this is a health system, or the workforce, or most importantly of all, the customers and the citizens, the green group, uh, to understand that this is working, because then your successor will have to keep doing it. And often the yellow group in the middle and the green group around the outside are combining to put pressure on the workforce and the system to change it. Uh, in Singapore, as everywhere else, Technology is going to transform healthcare in the next 10 years. I had a conversation with this over lunch with some senior people in the health system here in Singapore, thinking better about it than probably anybody else. There's going to be a transformation. The citizens are becoming empowered. Somebody just wrote a book. You know the normal phrase, the doctor will see you now. Somebody just wrote a book called The Patient Will See You Now. The boot's on the other foot. The green and the yellow are going to combine to change health systems, education systems, etc., etc., empowered by technology. What does that look like? You've got to embed your change in uh, the population and in the workforce. Um, and then there's drift. Drift is a, a big problem for a government. Uh, governments that drift along 
uh, tend to just stumble from one mistake to another. Um, Churchill made this speech back in the 1930s uh, criticizing the then Chamberlain government, actually it was the Baldwin government and then the Chamberlain government for drift. Uh, wonderful uh, Churchillian phrases about decided only to be undecided, resolved to be irresolute, adamant for drift. Um, governments need momentum, they need a sense of purpose, they need a direction. Momentum itself will help you solve problems. Which leads uh, to my conclusion, summarising everything I've said, uh, and then I'll hand it over to you and please feel free to ask anything. Um, bad governments do the red stuff, the government by spasm, they just react to events. Good governments govern by routine. Um, and this is what I've been describing. And if government governs by routine, it makes an enormous difference to the outcomes for citizens. And as I was saying at the beginning, the quality of government is an enormous uh, contributor to people being able to lead fulfilled lives. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, and please feel free to ask any question that you'd like.